Okay, carrying on here to page three. Um, what would, how would the bond angle change upon going from CLF to cation to CLF to anion? So bond angle, that's going to be a function of molecular structure. So we need to draw these two molecules and figure out um, what their shapes are, um, molecular geometries, and we can tell what the bond angle would do then. So CLF2, CL, of course, is less electronegative. It's lower down on the periodic table. So for both of these, we're going to have the same skeleton here. We're going to have fluorine in the middle, sorry, chlorine in the middle with fluorines on the periphery. Um, what will be different is the electrons. So chlorine and fluorine both come with seven. So that would be 21 from just a neutral um, atoms. The plus charge indicates one fewer than that. So the cation would have 20 electrons. The anion, that indicates one more than the 21. So the cation would have 20. The anion would have 22 electrons. So we can think about that as we draw this in because we've used up four. We need uh, 12 more to finish off the octets on the fluorines. So at that stage, 12 from there, 14, 16 total. So for the cation, it's just four more. So that would be the cation. Right? And then the anion would be the same except two additional electrons. So the fluorines would stay the same. Um, but we would have three sets of electrons on the chlorine for the anion there. Now, looking at the structures there, the central atom in the cation has four sets of electrons. That's a tetrahedral electron geometry, and that corresponds to a bond angle of about 109.5 degrees. And whereas in the second one, there are five sets of electrons here. That's an electron geometry of trigonal bipyramid. Now, a trigonal bipyramid, where three of the um, sets of electrons are lone pairs, the two bonding pairs will go into axial positions. So this will actually be a linear molecule. The fluorines will go there and there with the lone pairs occupying what would be called the equatorial positions of the trigonal bipyramid. So the bond angle here would be 180 degrees between the chlorine and fluorine bonds. So the bond angle would change from 109.5 to 180, right? As we kind of move that third lone pair in, let's go separate the fluorines out into that different geometry. Okay. All right, second question. What is the density of a sample of CCl2F2 at 213 millimeters of mercury and a temperature of minus 24? degrees C. So density, so this is a gas law problem, right? That's going to be a gas at room temperature. We've got a temperature, we've got a pressure, right? And we're trying to figure out the density. Now density is mass per unit volume. So in the case of a gas, that would be grams per liter. Um, the other pieces of information that would be helpful here are our gas constant. Now on the test, oops, 0.0821 liter atmospheres per Kelvin mole, right? That's helpful. And the other thing we could get here is molar mass. That would be a good thing to have here. One carbon, two chlorines, two fluorines. So 12.01, um, two times 35.45, if you find chlorine in your periodic table, and two times 19.00. Double check my periodic table. Yes, 19.00. So the molar mass here, 38 plus 70, whoops. Molar mass of this guy is 120.91 grams per mole. Now, with that additional information, we have enough to figure out the density here. This is one of those problems where there's multiple ways to do it. You could start with P equals NRT, add in molar mass and mass to uh, replace N, rearrange to get density on one side. Um, you could use your ideal gas law. Um, actually, I don't know that you can use the ideal gas law here because you only have two variables. Um, so you would have to um, go with the mass here some in some 
sense to get to where you're going. Um, but I guess you could say you have one mole and, and factor the mass in that way. Um, but what I would do here is just let my units kind of guide me to the right way to solve the problem. Um, if I recognize that I want grams per liter as what I end up with, starting with the molar mass of the compound would be a good place to get grams on top of my units. So if I just start with 120.91 .9, grams per mole, I've got grams. Now what I need to do is cancel out moles and maybe introduce liters on the bottom. Well, both of those are in the gas constant. And if I flip the gas constant over and I put Kelvin moles on top and liter atmospheres on the bottom, so that means the 0 0.0821 would be on the bottom. That cancels out moles, right? And it introduces liters. I've got grams on top, I've got liters on the bottom. I've got the units I want for my answer. The only difficulty now is I have some units I don't want. I've got Kelvins, I've got atmospheres. Um, so I want to get rid of those as well. So what if I take my temperature and I convert it to Kelvin, then I could just divide by it and get rid of the Kelvin in my number. So negative 24, uh, I'm going to subtract 24 from 273. That would be 249 Kelvin. So I'm just going to divide by 249 Kelvin here to account for the Kelvin units. Get rid of that. Now, all I have left is atmospheres. Well, my pressure up here is in millimeters of mercury. So let's get to millimeters of mercury. One atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury. That would get rid of the atmospheres. Right? And now if I just multiply by that pressure, that will get rid of millimeters of mercury. Right? That whole mathematical operation will leave me with grams per liter, which is how we calculate density or the units we use to describe density. Now I just need to plug these numbers in. So 120.91, hit the right buttons would help too. 120.91 divided by 0 0.0821 divided by 249 Kelvin divided by 760 millimeters of mercury there. Right? And then times 213 millimeters of mercury. And I get, um, say, looks like three significant figures pretty much is, is our limit. So 1.66 grams per liter would be the density of that gas under those conditions, that temperature and pressure. Okay. Now, just to point out right, the other, other method you could use here, um, if you start with PV equals NRT, um, we maybe could recognize that you can get to moles by taking the mass and dividing it by the molar mass. So PV is equal to mass of the sample times RT over the molar mass of the gas. Right? There you've got the two pieces that go into density. You've got the mass and the volume. So if you rearrange this equation, so you have mass over volume on one side. So let's keep mass on the right, divide through by volume. We'd have mass over volume. Now the other pieces I need to move to the left. So I'm going to multiply the left by molar mass. So that'd be pressure times molar mass. And then divide both sides by R and T. Right? So P times the molar mass over RT is equal to mass over volume, which is density. So if you rearrange the equation like that, then all you have to do is plug in those same pieces, right? You plug in the pressure, um, the temperature on the bottom, the molar mass on the top, and R on the bottom, which is exactly what we did by following the units. But that gives you another way you can kind of work through um, the problem. Okay, I think that's a good place to stop. The next one has six parts, all Lewis structures. Um, so I'll, I'll start that in a separate video.